Welcome to the Dash Mindset Podcast. I'm Sherry Ziefenbergen. You were born, you're gonna die, and your adventure is your dash in between. So make the most of it. Unlock your potential in all aspects of your dash by embracing your uniqueness and living in a way that's authentic to you. Not by doing more things, but by focusing on the right things. I'm a former corporate leader turned coach who's on my own journey, and I'm passionate about helping you on your journey too. So on the podcast, we'll explore how to live authentically by deciphering who you truly are and what you truly want. Are you ready to take a step toward designing your dash? Someday doesn't actually exist. So let's do it now. Hello, everyone. It's Sherry Z with the Dash Mindset. And today I'm so excited to have my friend Gina Brown here. She's the founder of Magnify Innovation and Leadership, and you are going to adore her. So um, I'm just going to start with that. (laughs) Gina, I'm going to let Gina just tell us all about herself. So Gina, you take it from here. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. I am um, honored to be here and be on your show. Let's see. I have been a corporate person for a long, long time. And a couple of years ago, I just kind of had the realization that perhaps the impact I can make is much further beyond the corporate world. So about a year-ish ago, I struck out on my own to create my new business and it became something that I'm really passionate about. It's like this intersect of all the things that I'm passionate about when it comes to innovation and leadership, but mostly the, the leader's impact on the employee experience and the human experience and what that looks like and how that actually does impact innovation. And then add to add a layer on top of that um, as something where in 2020, I was diagnosed with ADHD. And it's one of those things where um, I think you're all familiar with that pan- pandemic thingy that we went through. So, you know, we get to this pandemic and we all go home and now we're working from home. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, why am I struggling so much with the things that normally I wasn't struggling with? Why, why are things so hard? Why, you know, I felt like I was going to miss deadlines. I just felt really out of control and just kind of out of it. And I was talking to my sister, I was talking to a friend of mine and they just kind of said, well, you know, maybe this is an ADHD thing. So I went in September of 2020 and got diagnosed. And it was one of those things where it was like this huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. But the thing was, is that when I went back to work, I wasn't able to articulate my needs to my leader because I didn't even know it was so nuanced. I didn't even know the ways that ADHD was showing up in the workplace or that the things that I was struggling with were ADHD specifically. You know, some of them like the glaring ones, yes, but some of the underpinnings, they were just really subtle that I didn't actually realize were ADHD. And it's like, I've been on this journey, um, of, you know, knowing more and more about leadership and really um, understanding leadership at a very different level. And now layering in on top of that, the ADHD experience and how those two intersect. And so now it's where, you know, I've got this passion of really helping people who've had ADHD. How do you articulate? How do you get it to the point where you can work with your leader to really pull out your strengths and be able to perform in a way that works for your brain. And I think so many of the things that we're taught, so many of the methods that we are taught are working for a neurotypical brain, but not necessarily a neurodiverse brain. So it's not really a problem, you know, when people are struggling and they're having challenges, it's not a problem with potential, it's a problem with their method. And so when we get them the right methods that work for their brain, then it can make a really big difference, not only for the person with ADHD, but also for the leader and how do you navigate um, some of those things as a leader? And, you know, I've had a lot of friends talk to me about, gosh, well, how do you know it's ADHD when someone is having a performance issue? And just kind of talking about those types of things, right? And, And ADHD isn't something that we have to say, you know, it's not an excuse. It's, you know, not a moral failing. It's not something where it's like, oh, if you just tried harder, right? We don't tell people who are in a wheelchair, we wouldn't say just try harder to walk up the steps, right? That would be incredibly insulting and insensitive, right? So we say we understand when you have a disability that is visible, that they need some accommodations. So how do we say, you know, we just need some accommodations for those who 
have neurodiversity so that they can then be able to perform and use their strengths in a way that are meaningful. So this is where, you know, the last couple of years have really been where my passion is and and where I've kind of um, built a business around that. So it's been pretty exciting. That is so fantastic, Gina. I just, and I love that I've known you along this, you know, throughout this whole time. And so just seeing how passionate you are about this, it's just so fun to see because I mean, it's, it's, and I haven't known you for, you know, I didn't know you pre pandemic, but just, (laughs) I mean, having witnessed, it almost seems like there's like a weight off of you, right? Which I think is the case when we better understand ourselves because we we're all trying to, act according to the societal guidelines, whatever we believe those to be. And whether we have ADHD or we don't have ADHD, we're all trying to be a certain thing. And we feel like, oh, well, why can't I just try harder and do this thing? So so how did it, how, um, I guess, what is your feeling post understanding that you have ADHD relative to where you were before? Like how, does it feel like there's a gigantic weight off or does it just feel that way to me? No, it does feel like there's a gigantic weight off because I think pre-understanding um, that I had ADHD and pre-understanding my diagnosis, like I just thought it was me, right? Like I just thought the problem was always, I didn't think I was smart. I was, I always struggled in school. So I assumed that because I wasn't getting great grades, that that meant that I was not smart. And so I would kind of pulled that belief with me all the years through through college and through my career. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, wow, sometimes, you know, I'm successful despite myself. And um, I have everyone fooled and all of this kind of stuff. So I always kind of believed I had a lot of limited beliefs about myself. And, and it was based on a lot of these things. And I had these two mantras that I <clears throat> would always come to mind when I, you know, was at work or wherever. And it was like, oh, shoot, what did I miss? Or, oh, shoot, what did I forget? And so it was just, you know, I just always felt this stress missing something or forgetting something. And so naturally I had built some coping mechanisms. So I've always been a note taker and I take copious amounts of notes and I would tell people, well, this is my brain. Like, this is what I do. This is my memory. I have to be able to write that down. And now reflecting back on that, I realized that, you know, part of my note taking was that it made me focus on what was being said so that I would have to write that down. So there was that, but then I also had the notes to go back and refer to because, you know, working memory ain't so great up in here with, um, you know, for people with ADHD and I fall into that category. And so I think having an explanation of that and saying, gosh, this is not a character issue. I had a lot of shame that I carried around because it was like, you know, people would say, if you would just try harder and I'm like, oh my gosh, but I am trying hard. So it must be something else, right? So I, I must be stupid. I must be incapable. I must be And of course, it was nothing positive that came out of that. And so knowing that it's not this moral failing um, or a lack of willpower or weak character um, was really freeing for me because then it was like, oh, no, I just need different strategies. And actually, it was through the testing for ADHD that when I went through that testing, you know, there was an intelligence part of that. And, you know, when I'm sitting there looking at the scores, I was like, holy. I'm actually not stupid. Like, but it it took a test score on this, you know, on this assessment to actually get me to actually believe that that could possibly be true. Um, And so I think about the fact that I carried that with me for so long and it's only been in the last four years. And, you know, I'm in my forties. So you think about my entire adult life carrying those things with me. And it's just, I feel like that's where, you know, there's power in my story that I want to be able to share that with other people so that they don't have to go through it necessarily, that they don't have to go through that struggle and the shame and the the just incorrect assumptions that we've made about ourselves, right? So, and that's where it's like, how do I put strategy behind this passion to make sure that I can make some ultimate impact with that? So I think you know, with the diagnosis, it really did lift a lot off my shoulders and it it shifted my perspective dramatically. But it also, I feel like shifted and to the point where I feel empowered now 
<clears throat> and I don't want to say that I was a victim before, but I didn't feel like I had as much control. Now I feel like I know more about what I have control over and then what I can take action on based on that control. And that is a really freeing place to be and somewhere that I want others to experience as well, or at least help them peel back the layers um, on what that looks like in their life. So that's so good. And when you were talking about the fact that you, that you shared, oh, I have to take copious notes, you know, because of my brain, it almost, I suspect you were kind of felt like you had to explain your flaws as a human, like, Mm -hmm. oh, this is, you know, this is how I'm flawed. And therefore I have to do this when it's just, that's just who you are. There's nothing yeah. wrong with you. It's just how your brain works. Yeah. And all of our brains work differently. That's just the right. way it is, whether we have ADHD or we don't, or, and it's just a matter, like you said, of empowering ourselves. Yeah. So I love that. Well, and I think to that, to that point too, then it's like, how do we tell leaders, like, instead of flaw fixing, let's focus on strength building. And I think, you know, that's even something I'm doing myself, right? I'm going to focus on my strengths, not necessarily on my weaknesses, because of course, whatever you pay attention to is the thing that grows, right? So if a leader is going to consistently pay attention to all the flaws of what this person is doing, they may miss out on a lot of the benefits of what, how their mind works, like divergent thinking, for example, and oh my gosh, they are not a linear thinker. And they're going on these divergent thinking tangents and how great that can be because it's like when you, some of the best ideas come out of that and some of the best, you know, challenging the status quo and things like that can really come out of um, understanding divergent thinking. And there's just so much status quo, intentional or not, that we follow or rules that we follow that are just, we don't even realize their rules and kind of call them, you know, BS rules or whatever you want to call them. But I like that, yeah. you know, but there are these rules that we live by and then you don't even realize the impact that they're having, not only on yourself, but others. So, yeah. So I think it's important to be able to have these conversations and be able to say, no, we're shifting instead of focusing on weaknesses, we're going to focus on strengths. And now we're actually going to shift to a strategy that works that we can both live with from a leader employee standpoint that we both find a benefit from. And then we're going to move forward with that. Oh, that's so good. And like you said, the kind of that BS structure that we're conditioned to believe we should fall within, it's kind of like we're, we're expected to have this linear thinking, but linear thinking doesn't lead to innovation. And if everyone is thinking in a linear way, then, you know, how are we going to be creative and all these things? So, and I I will, it's, um, it makes me think so much, Gina, and I'm sure we've had this discussion, but my son has ADHD and he is so creative. And because um, focus is a pretty high strength for me, it's, it's just really hard. You know, when you, when you create another human, you just kind of expect that human to be like you, right? (laughs) So initially when he wasn't, I was confused. (laughs) So, but I remember when he was younger, just saying, you know, okay, just focus, buddy. You just need to focus. Kind of like just work harder. And I, I didn't understand, like, how can you not focus? And so now understanding that, I, I mean, I always appreciated his creativity and I was trying to find the line be, between, okay, continue being your creative self and draw all mm-hmm. over your math assignment, but also get your math done. You know, trying to figure out that uh-huh. line. So yeah. um, anyway, it's just, it's, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to understand because telling him just yeah. focus wasn't going to work just like a leader right. telling their, their employee, Hey, just work harder, yeah. just focus doesn't <laughs> work. So Well, and it's interesting because I think yesterday, just yesterday was my youngest birthday. And so I went up to the school and I have lunch with him, right? So, and while we're sitting there, they have this TV and it kind of cycles through with all the different things for the day. Like here's the menu, here's the date, it's, you know, B day. And so, you know, what specials you have and all that kind of stuff. And then it said birthday. So his name was on there. And then it said quote of the day and it was be focused, And I was like, hmm, interesting. Like, A, is that a quote? And B, like, 
there's just there's just so much to unpack there because ADHD is like the worst name of all names that they could ever give this well condition. I like to call it condition because it's not always a disorder for everybody. And I think disorder kind of I struggle with that a little bit. But the the problem isn't a deficit of attention. The problem is an overabundance of attention. It's that I it's not that I can't stay focused, is that I'm gonna focus on that and then I focus over there. And then my, my focus is very, very <laughs> multi right? It's pointed in a lot of different directions. And the other thing is that if you need me to focus on something, I need to be highly interested in that. And if I'm not interested in that, I'm just like do 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 do. So then it's like, how do we build in those tactics for our kids too, right? So you can say, hey, creative child who needs to do their math homework, um, maybe do it under the table upside down or, you know, do it with a, um, and I don't know, some teachers may not like it, but do it with a marker, do it with whatever, do it with different colors. Like how do you, you know, how do you make it interesting and fun in the process? Because yes, at the end of the day, we all know that we have outcomes that we have to meet and things that we get, that we have to get done. But that be focused can just look so many different ways for so many different people. And then you think about, and I'm just going to go off on a tangent here for a minute, but you think about all these organizations that shifted, um, and not to generalize, but many organizations shifted to open collaborative environments, right? And you think about what that does to someone who is neuro... (laughs) See? Doorbell. (laughs) If you think about what happens to someone who is neurodivergent when they're in an open collaborative environment. Now, all of a sudden, they've got people walking by, they have doorbells ringing, they have all these things happening. And so now their attention is directed to like, oh my gosh, my husband's answering the door and oh my gosh, over here. And so now you're distracted all the time because you're constantly in this this area of distraction. And so then, you know, noise canceling headphones and things like that. Those are the things that you need in order to survive kind of this open collaborative environment. So you think about that from an environmental standpoint, what's important for them as well and lowering this, those distractions or putting your phone away or whatever the case may be so that, you know, you can limit those distractions because you know, you're going to pay attention and focus on all the other different things that you shouldn't be focusing on. So, and it is, it's funny because when you just think, oh, let's have an open collaborative environment, it sounds like a fantastic idea, just so amazing, right? But it's not for everybody. And for the people who often make the decisions, it's hard to understand. I actually, so you know Steve Fredland, the safari dude, right? So he was on one of my episodes and I don't remember which one right now, but when you when you were saying that, it reminded me. So he he's a recovering actuary. And so he wants to focus as actuaries generally do. I'm doing air quotes. And so he would wear the headphones and then they put him in this open collaborative environment. And I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't, and we didn't talk about ADHD specifically, but just his brain just doesn't want to be in an open collaborative environment. I was like, okay, but then it's also going to be unproductive. Right. There's a time and a place for that. If you want to go collaborate as a team, then then allow for those opportunities. But then it's like you just have to be able to understand that we all work differently. And so therefore, we all need different environments. You know, someone may want a coffee shop where there's music playing and lots of background noise and other people might need complete silence and nothing. And someone might need, you know, just you know, different classical music or whatever it may be, but we all need different things to be able to focus. And so then, you know, to have to be able to go to a leader and say, I can't get anything done because I'm in too open of an environment. And it's just, it's shocking really what some people, how some people will react to that because they do it. So their reaction is based on their lens, right? So I'm going to put this through my filters and my lens and it's not a problem for me. So I don't know what the problem is for you. And so then, you know, it's like, okay, well, I, I'm going to um, get a conference room then and I'm going to go into the conference room and use that. But then now I'm going to get in trouble because I'm not available. I'm not, you know, where people can just come up to me 50 times a day and interrupt me and ask me a question. And it's just, you know, so being able to have those discussions. And I think really it, it all boils down to awareness, 
right? And understanding, hey, I'm a leader. I want to understand how these people operate so that I can give them the environment where they can be the most successful, whether that's a physical environment, the emotional environment, you know, we talk about psychological safety a lot. We talk about curiosity. And I think, you know, when we, when I talk about what's important for leadership and understanding neurodiversity, I'm not expecting that these leaders are going to go off and like, you know, they have, have to do all this ADHD training and things like that. It's, it's more like, no, I need to understand the nuance of ADHD, but also understand I'm not going to know everything. I don't need to know everything because I can build this relationship with my employee. We can build strategies together. And then it's more of a conversation, awareness, curiosity, and then you're employing some of these things like psychological safety and curiosity, you know, and then also just, gosh, I can now um, leverage divergent thinking in ways that I didn't know that I should do before. So we might need that new skill set. But I think, you know, the thing that worries me a lot when I look at some of the statistics that are out there and it's showing that, you know, up to 51% of our managers have no training and a skill set for leadership. And then you look at the accommodation request in colleges and universities has ridden, risen 30% over the last decade. And you think about all these kids that are graduating from high school and they're coming into the workplace and they have been accommodated. And so they're going to expect that. But there's this huge disconnect between college and your career and even the knowledge of what they know from an accommodation standpoint and how leaders are prepared for that. And then it becomes this whole conversation about accommodations, which is really, you know, let's think about it as adaptations because, you know, you think about things that are in our life that are mainstream right now that were actually developed for people with disabilities, but it's so mainstream. We wouldn't even know that like a curb cutout, for example, if you ride your bike on the sidewalk or you're on a skateboard or you're, you know, you're pushing a stroller or pulling a wagon and those curb cutouts are just fabulous for that. And it's like, Oh no, those were actually designed for people in wheelchairs so that they could actually navigate the sidewalks and get on the sidewalks. And it's become something that's very mainstream, right? Um, Texting was a tool that was actually developed for people who were deaf in a way that they could communicate. Well, how many of us could go without texting or talk to text? Same thing. That was created for people with disabilities. And so when I think about accommodations, it's like, well, you could call it that and you could think of it as this thing you have to do to make it you know, easier for someone. Or you could think about it as this is how we adapt to society to actually get to the point where we can function more effectively and efficiently and it works for everyone. And I think that's the beautiful thing about neurodiversity. That's the beautiful thing about when you're shifting your leadership style, when you accommodate neurodiversity, you accommodate everyone. When you only accommodate neurotypical people, you only accommodate neurotypical, right? So it's one of those things where if we think about, you know, and people call this universal design, whatever you want to call it. But when we get to the point where it's serving everyone well, amazing things can happen. And then going back to what we talked about at the very beginning with innovation, and then you create this environment where innovation can thrive. And when companies learn how to harness the strengths of people with neurodiversity, oh my gosh, their innovation, productivity, effectiveness, customer satisfaction, so many of these things increase, but it's how do you, you know, that's great in concept, but the reality is so much different. So how do we give leaders the tools, the skills, and the mindset that they need in order to be able to build that environment so that those things can actually become reality instead of just a concept? Woo, I told you I was going to go on a tangent. <laughs> I loved all of it. I loved the entire tangent. It's funny too, how it's, we, we kind of think, okay, there's neurodivergent people and then there are non-neurodivergent people when really everybody has their own way of thinking and working, but it, we automatically think, oh, well now we need to accommodate these people. No, we should really just have an awareness and understanding of every person's unique abilities. And then 
we can leverage the collective genius of everyone if we allow people to work in the way they're meant to work. Yeah. And it's funny because not funny, haha, necessarily, but when we think about when we kind of look at ADHD, ADHD, you know, we talked about the name being a terrible name. It's not really a lack of attention or deficit of attention. It's just that we have focus in a lot of different areas. Right. But when we think about it, like, it's an executive functioning condition. So it's the it's the management system of our brain, which is located in the prefrontal cortex. It's it's kind of like the the CEO of our brain. It's how we it's how we adult. It's how we get things done. And so, you know, it's coordinating and doing all of these things. And there are six, well, there depending on who you talk to, there could be a lot, but we boil it down to basically six different executive functions. So we've got working memory, we've got inhibition, emotional regulation, planning and problem solving, self-awareness and self-motivation. And when you look at those and think about some of the issues that are in there, then yes, that is something that is something that people with ADHD deal with a lot. But then look at autism, autism spectrum disorder, also something that they deal with executive functioning, also dyslexia. Oh, but also if you're pregnant, if you are postpartum, if you're going through menopause, oh, if you have depression or if you have anxiety or if you have um, thyroid issues or if you have sleep apnea, these all can also affect your executive functioning. So now instead of the, let's say ADHD, for example, five to 9% of the population, right? So if we're looking at that that's a lot of, a lot, a lot of people, you know, we're talking about over 550 million people who potentially have ADHD. And now you add on all the other things that we just mentioned, you know, oh, pregnant people. Oh my gosh. You know, and you think about the brain fog and things like this. And then you think about, we have these cell phones and we have, you know, this digital world that we live in. that's just constantly pinging us and pinging us and pinging us. And so now when you're talking about the sheer number of people who are distracted. (laughs) And now we're talking about a pretty significant amount of the population. So to me, this isn't just an ADHD thing. This is something where it's like, we do need to respect the fact that everyone's brain, everyone is going through something. Everyone has something. How do we provide that compassionate leadership? How do we make sure that people have the tools that they need to best perform as opposed to the authority piece of it? Do as I say, you know, (laughs) kind of leadership, but rather just acknowledging the human experience and that there's something for that we all need to acknowledge that we're going through, whether it's, you know, a loved one is sick or whatever the case may be. And then I think that's where that compassionate leadership is so crucial and critical because it's not just an ADHD story anymore. It's not just a neurodiversity story. It's a human story. And this is how we can best serve the humans that, you know, companies talk all the time about how our people are our greatest assets it's like, yeah, they, they sure are. You know, people are the, the reason that these companies are succeeding and we need to take care of them. And, you know, um, Sherm just recently put out their report saying that well-being is a big piece of what people are looking for in an employer. And well-being, this goes to the types of leaders and caring leaders that really understand the human condition and therefore lead according to that human condition. Um, but it's just, yeah. you can very much focus it in on just ADHD and just neurodiversity, but my goodness, the ripple of, of just being human and having a brain goes far beyond that. So (laughs) yes, we all have a brain and it all, they all function differently. So a couple things. So I did not realize it was what the, the, the um, percentages were for ADHD. But what do you think about the fact that um, I was reading a book about, maybe it was about ADHD, but just considering the fact that ADHD isn't something we really heard about when we were younger. And since we're about the same age, I'm going to say we, Gina. But I mean, it wasn't, it was kind of like, oh, that kid is just hyper or that whatever, whatever, whatever. And so I think there's so many humans out there who are older, who probably have ADHD and never had it diagnosed and are continuing to feel like something is just wrong with them. And then we have, because I mean, you found out just four years ago. And then we have people who um, are maybe just ignoring it because they don't want to. So maybe they're not even investigating it. They're just ignoring it because they think that's a disorder. Um, 
and it's just it's just interesting to think about I don't know how many people are actually I mean every one of us is operating differently than anyone else and then there are people who are just trying to ignore what their differences are and trying to operate against the 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 what am I trying to say? against the stream against the what am I trying to current against the current that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and and we have like you said all this other distraction like every person on the planet is distracted and ADHD is just part of that and everybody's just operating differently it's just being human is hard. Yeah. And there's still a camp that believe that ADHD isn't real. It's like, well, okay, but it, it is, it's scientifically proven. It's a neurobiological issue. It's cognitive disorder. It's not a behavioral disorder, um, which people think a lot of times it's behavioral because of course the symptoms you see them behaviorally, but it is a something is cognitive. It is the way that you are wired, um, which is why learning new skills is something that's really important for the ADHD brain and learning skills that actually work that so many, so many of the shelves, you know, help self-help books that are on these shelves. It's like, Oh, self-help for neurotypicals, but you read these books and then you're just like, I should be able to do it. Cause this book says that I should be able to do it, but you can't. And so that's why finding strategies that work for you are so important. But I think, you know, when talking about stats, you know, we're talking five to 9% of the population having ADHD, but you talk about 90% of those um, are not diagnosed. So you have 90% of the ADHD population walking around without a diagnosis and 75% of people with ADHD don't even know that they have it. Case in point, me up until four years ago. And so exactly to your point, you're walking around and just thinking that it's a you problem, it's a you problem, it's a you problem, right? And yeah, there's um, a gentleman, by the way, by the name of um, Dr. Ned Hallowell. And he describes that, that, you know, when you tell someone with ADHD just to try harder, it's like telling someone who's, you know, who needs glasses or needs corrective lenses that if you just squint harder, you should be able to see, right? It's, it is a biological reason in their brain, just like it's a biological reason with someone's eyes that they're unable to do those things. So just demanding that they try harder, do these things. So that's why the new strategies are, are so important. And then, you know, I've heard other people too, that they'll just be like, well, you know, I hear it with OCD a lot too. Oh, my OCD is kicking in or people will just kind of drop it as, oh, my ADHD, but they don't necessarily have a diagnosis. And people will say, oh yeah, everybody's, you know, a little bit ADHD. Well, sure. Everyone is distracted to some point. You may have attention deficit trait where you don't necessarily, it, you know, you don't meet all of the criteria in the, the statistical manual that our doctors and psychologists use to actually diagnose. They don't meet that, but they still have those traits. The difference for people with ADHD is that it is chronic. It is, it has been a lifelong thing. They've been dealing with this since childhood. You know, my earliest memories of having issues with ADHD go back to seventh grade and, you know, the struggle in seventh grade. Um, And I think the other part of this, too, I'm kind of going all over the place weird. Um, So often when we were younger, it's the boys, right? It's the boys who get diagnosed because they're naughty, disruptive boys. And so they're the ones that are the most noticeable so that they would get diagnosed. But kids like me, I was not disruptive. I was not naughty. I was very much a rule follower. I've always been a people pleaser. People pleasing is a big part of ADHD, right? Because we just don't want to, we don't want to upset people, whatever the case may be. We can do a whole podcast just about people pleasing. So we kind of go under the radar. And then so often women will just be like, I'm struggling with this or this or that. And so then they're like, well, you have anxiety. And so then they get diagnosed with anxiety when really the core of the the root cause of some of these things is ADHD. And when you try treat the right condition, because the other thing about ADHD is it is the most treatable and manageable of all disorders, of all the psychological disorders, it is the most treatable and manageable because you can learn new skills and because you can, um, you know, shift habits and learn new things to be able to shift that dialogue and shift. And it takes a lot of work and it's, it's hard, but it's doable. But I think that that's something too, is that, you know, it's just so many of us, this has just been the norm since childhood and you don't know any different. So yeah, you just carry it with you everywhere you go, but it's, the stats are pretty alarming when you really 
think about it. My family, for example, I am the only one when I look at my family, 26 people that I'm including in, you know, I could go further, but 26 people that I'm including in this bubble and 11 of us, I'm assuming I'm making some, taking some liberties here. I am not a doctor. I cannot diagnose ADHD, but I suspect that there are 11 of us who have it. And I am the only one who's diagnosed. I mean, so that sticks right with that 90%, right? So <clears throat> it's just really interesting when you think about it. And some kind of know it, but a lot of them don't, which also tracks with the 75% who don't know that they have it. And gently having those conversations, you know, have you ever considered, which, you know, is something that leaders have to be incredibly cautious and I would not recommend that they <laughs> tell their people to go, you should go get diagnosed, right? We're not, we're not expecting that, but rather it's just understanding that, you know, because again, going back to that human condition, there are lots of different things that people are dealing with. And so therefore we're going to use um, a different style for our leadership to make sure that people are using their strengths and being the best that they can be and thriving in the environment that we have created for them. Okay, so I have three things. One, not only were you carrying, so seventh grade is when you have your earliest memories of that, but you're not just continuing, you're not just carrying those behaviors throughout your life. You're carrying the beliefs that went with it too. Like you said, like, oh, I must not be smart. And so it's not just now that you're not, or now that you're diagnosed, it's not like, oh, I'm intelligent and I have tools. I mean, you still have to every day remind yourself, oh, wait a minute. I'm not dumb like I thought I was in seventh grade because, I mean, you just have to go through that process every day. So it's like just the impact that it has when when we don't investigate potentially getting diagnosed or just investigate, okay, how can I discover more about myself? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that mindset shift is big it's, and it's very gradual, right? Cause it mindset is the easiest and hardest thing to do. It's easiest because you have access to it and you can start working on it immediately, but it's hard because you're actually shifting those beliefs and, right. and the things that you have carried with you for so long. So yeah, it's a process and it takes work and it mm -hmm. takes, um, a willingness because it, yes, yes. it kind of sucks some of the time. It does. <laughs> yeah, sure does. <laughs> I, I can confirm that it does suck sometimes. The other thing I was going to mention too is, um, I mean, you and I have talked about this, but it makes me realize too, like when even when I was talking about my son and the fact that when he was little, I was little, he he's, he's a teenager now, but, um, it's not like he's an adult yet, but, um, yeah. just saying to him, focus, he was focused, but he was focused on something different than what mm -hmm. I wanted him to focus on. Yeah. Yep. So I loved what you, the point that you were making about the fact that it's not a lack of focus. It's just right. a focus on a number of things. Like right. I thought math was more important and he thought, his drawings were more important. So yeah, yeah just trying yeah. to figure out the line between that. Well, um, I think oh, understanding, understanding your kid to say, gosh, I know my kid. I also know that my kid loves to play video games. Uh -huh. So how do I gamify this homework to say, can you do these number, you know, how, what, however would work for him, right? To say, can you do these five math problems in 20 minutes, right? We still want him to do careful math and all that kind of stuff, but can sometimes just starting is the hardest part, right? So like you gamify it and say, gosh, knowing my kid, these are my kid's interests. This is what he likes to do. How do I give him a challenge that would gamify it or whatever the case may be to, to help him find that motivation to get some of it done too? Yeah. And when we just have this thought that, oh, he just needs to focus. He just needs to work harder. Gamification does not come into play. <laughs> you know, it's like, we just got to stop and think, okay, what's going to work for him? Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I still have my, I have a couple, well, I have three boys and the youngest, you know, I don't have any of them diagnosed at this point. Um, but you know, I, the youngest has shown signs that perhaps he is, you know, ADHD. And so what I've talked to the teacher about is that whatever challenge you come up against, tell me, and I will give you a specific strategy that you can use for that, because I know my child, but I also respect her as a teacher with that skill set, you know, that I don't have as a teacher. 
So how do we collaborate to understand or just by saying, you know, hey, um, he's not getting his math homework done during class. It's like, yeah, well, that's understandable. Is that something that we can actually do that within, you know, can we do that at night or can we do that in different ways? Can he do that in a different location? Can he do it under the table? You know, or, you know, things like that. So how do you create some conditions, physical and otherwise, um, where he can be a little more comfortable to do that? You know, if, if bright lights are bothering your kid or different sounds or that kid over there keeps making noises and I can't focus because all they're doing is making noises and I'm just focusing over there or the tag in my shirt keeps bugging me and I can't, how am I supposed to do my math when, you know, focusing on the tag on my shirt, because that's the other thing is that we, those things get amplified in our brains. So if something is that, that's what you're focusing on. And it's so much bigger than it would be for someone who's neurotypical. So then it's like, well, how do we shift that environment? Again, asking questions because, well, is it a rule that I really need to get this done right now? Or is that just something, you know, we can question and come up with it? You know, if the outcome, if the outcome is to have this worksheet done, does it really matter the when and how? And can we figure out what that is? And I think that's important for leaders, too is that if we focus on outcomes and what we need the end result to be and we let people with ADHD or whoever, you know, figure out what works for them for the how, then, you know, if you can say, gosh, I, my brain actually doesn't turn on until after 7 p.m., you know, can I break up the day so I can be there for all of our agile ceremonies in the morning and the team meetings and all that kind of stuff, but but are you okay with it if I, you know, start working at 7 o'clock at night because, you know, man, at midnight, I'm getting a lot of stuff done. Well, you know, and it's like, how do we take out the filter of preference, which I think is hard for leaders to do because they have a lot of preference. Um, Well, I have seen there are cases where leaders will layer in their preference into these things. It's like, okay, when you remove your preference and you say, um, you know, remove your beliefs of, well, you should work nine to five and all of these kind of things. But understanding, gosh, Johnny's brain works better at night And so I'm going to respect that because that's the other thing. If you want to, you know, that's another topic for another day is chronotypes. So we are chronotypes. So we talk about how all of our bodies are actually designed to function at different times of the day too, right? So, you know, but having that flexibility and just saying, we're going to focus on outcomes. We're going to let you figure out the how so that you can do it the best way that works for you. And the whole nine to five thing was established during the industrial revolution. It's this whole arbitrary system that we've all just kind of signed up for that doesn't always make a lot of sense. And I think a lot of times leaders just immediately, the immediate reaction is, oh, well, we can't do everything different for everybody. But when we really think about what, why, why not? Because if, 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 the, we we're really looking for a positive result. If that's what we want, if that's the outcome we want, who cares how we get there? Right. Well, and even let's look at meetings, right? So we're in meeting after meeting, after meeting, after meeting. And the thing that if, if let's just say, for example, it's me and I'm sitting in a meeting and I'm like, oh my gosh, we've been here for an hour and a half. I've not stood up. Now my butt is numb and I'm just sitting here and I'm just sitting here and I'm focusing on the fact that I'm just sitting here and this meeting is going on forever. And the numbness of your butt. Yeah. I have no idea. Right now I'm missing what's actually happening in the meeting. And that's clearly a hypothetical situation um, that, you know, it's like, but now I'm focusing on all of the other things. I'm focusing on the fact that this guy over here won't stop shaking his foot. And this person over here is chomping their gum. And I just want to like throw my water bottle at them because they're chomping their gum and mouth noises about send me over the edge. Right. And so now like I am so dysregulated right now because of all the different things that are going on. I can't be productive in this meeting. So it's even like, how do we allow motion in those meetings to say, you know, we're going to take quick micro breaks, literally two minutes, stand up, move about the cabin, take a lap around and then come right back in. Like we don't, we're really not going to make, say it's a two minute break, but it's going to be a 10 minute break. No, we are literally giving you two minutes. You have 120 seconds to go out and come back and just moving and changing that environment or letting people stand in meetings or, you know, like throw a beanbag in the corner, let somebody sit in the beanbag. Like even the way that we conduct our meetings is something where it's like, yes, if we have to have meetings, fine, that's fine. 
But how do we ensure that people can actually be productive and show up to those meetings in the best way? And so how do we allow for people to, to move? Moving is such an important part um, for the ADHD brain and really just humanity in general, right? So even exploring what that can look like and get real creative with that stuff too. And it's, it's not on leaders to figure it all out. It's, I mean, what you're suggesting right. is that there's a conversation and you lead with curiosity yes. and determine, okay, how yes. can we work on this together? It's not up to leaders to yes. figure out, okay, do we need bean bags? Do we need bouncy balls? Do we need to yeah, let everybody yeah, work, yeah. you know, whatever hours they want? It's just going to be chaos. That's not, that's not the solution. Right. And I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm so glad you said that because that is a big, 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 big point is that it is not a problem for leaders to solve all the time, right? This is not something where the expectation is, yeah, now you have to have a bounce house and you have to have this, you have to be house. fun, you have to be like, awesome, right? It's not that. It's not that you have to make everything awesome, but you just have to be open to having the conversation and you have to be open to say, yeah, you know, or, or the, well, in my day, I always had to sit there in meetings or whatever. Okay, fine. But this, this is a new time, right? And, and so I think it's just being open to exploring what those other possibilities could be is all that they need to be. And I think it's really, 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 really important also to make sure that people understand that people with ADHD are fully capable and should be held accountable. It is not an excuse to say, I have ADHD, therefore I can't. Like that is not what I'm talking about. But it's understanding that I am capable but my capabilities are going to show up differently and my strengths are going to show up differently and I can be held accountable. But what you expect from other people may not work for me. And so just, again, that dialogue is such an important part of that. And so I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that is um, something that needs to be emphasized and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced is that this is not the responsibility of the leader. That's not what I'm saying, but it is a collaborative opportunity to say, how can you work best? And also understand that people with ADHD may not know yet. It takes sometimes years to even figure out, oh, I didn't even know that was an ADHD thing, right? And and so even people that were diagnosed as children, sometimes it takes seven to 10 years for them to figure out how ADHD actually manifests in the workplace. So there may be times where as a leader, you say, gosh, what do you need? How can I help you? And they're like, I don't know. Right. I don't know. Either. Which is the case with yeah, anyone, right? right? It's not like right. everyone knows, oh, I know exactly what I need, right? So yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, and it depends on the situation, it depends on the people involved. It, there are a lot of factors that go into that. Right. So, um, and I think that's where some empathy goes a long way with that. And I think empathy is a huge skill that leaders can deploy, um, to get the best out of their people, whether they're ADHD or not. So, and in general, yeah. it's not up to leaders to have all the answers for anything really, but exactly. the responsibility of a leader is to to help people meet their potential, whether they have ADHD or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, that's, that's basically what I built. The premise that I built my company around is that leaders create the environment where, and then insert innovation people. Um, you know, the environment is such an important factor, but that's what allows people to thrive. So create leaders, create the environment and not to put this extra pressure on there, but it, but it is true. Right. And it, we talk about innovation. And when I was at, um, in my last role before I started my company was an innovation role. And it was so often I'm having conversations with leaders and they're like, yeah, yeah, I need to dedicate more time to innovation. I need to schedule more time on my calendar. And I'm like, well, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, that's not like I'm going to be like, um, from the hours of two to 3 PM, I will be innovative. You know, I'm not talking about that, but it's how do you engage your team during team meetings? How do you, when you have a neurodivergent person, when you have someone with ADHD that is just bombarding you with ideas all the time, you know, what are you doing with those ideas? Are you dismissing them? Are you saying, stop bringing me ideas? Cause I've actually had a leader tell me that. Would you please just stop with ideas? <laughs> mm. Mm. 
mm -hmm, that went well. That, I mean, that really incentivizes you, I think. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, the shame and all that, oh, I am stupid and, you know, all those things, which shame is a really big thing that people with ADHD deal with on a regular basis. But it's like, no, then you can say, hey, I love that you have all these ideas. We can't use them all right now, but I would love it if you could put them on a mirror board or find another way that we can actually capture them. Um, can we build a repository? And then that can be something, hey, if you could do that, if you could get that repository built, and then I'm going to give you a date to, to do that. And it's like, you know, those are the things when they're interested, when it's applicable, when it's relevant, you know, take advantage of that. Um, procrastination, you know, this is something where leaders, I've heard leaders get super frustrated about, you know, people procrastinating and, you know, getting things right up to the deadline. And that's like, yep, that is correct. If you are dealing with someone with ADHD, which you may not know because they may or may not have disclosed that to you as a leader, which is another reason why leaders need to just have these skills. But, um, you know, <clears throat> oh, shoot, now I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that because my mind just went 18 different places. Well, I was thinking about that, but yeah, it's just, you know, as a leader, how do you just provide them with, um, oh, procrastination. That's what I was talking about. We were talking about procrastination and you're saying, um, you know, I hate it when they, they miss a deadline or they're always going right up to, you know, the last minute. It's like, yes, if you tell someone with ADHD, I need that by Tuesday, then I'm like, okay, but what do you mean Tuesday end of business? Uh, so is that like 4 59 PM? What's the end of business? Do you mean end of day, like 11 59 end of day? Like they're being very specific and offering that specificity is really important for an ADHD brain. Because I tell you what, if you tell me end of day, I will get it to you literally by 11 59 because <laughs> That's and call it procrastination or not, that is when my brain turns on, that is when I'm interested, and that is when I'm going to do my best work. So, leaders, take advantage of that, stop being mad about it. Instead, use that as a tool to understand hey, this is what they're going to do. I'm going to give them a deadline that has to be done by 4 59 on Tuesday. And then it's like, oh, okay, now I have a deadline. Or if you want to see their work, well, this is actually due here. Okay, I want a draft deadline by this date. Because people with ADHD, if you give them 30 days and you say, I'm going to give you 30 days to get this done, you'd be like, okay, I'll start working on it on day 28. <laughs> <laughs> or 29. Or 29. Or 29, right? They're not going to because they their brain is not interested at this point, right? So it's not that they're just, you know, they're being lazy and it's not that they're just procrastinating because, you know, they're the, the somehow means that they're not an adequate worker. That just means that their brain ignites at that time. And oh man, are you going to get some good work? And so take advantage of that. So that's a strategy leaders can employ and say, oh, I got you. I see you. I see how your brain works. Here's a deadline and go for it. And it's not like, and it doesn't mean they don't care. Right. And it's not like you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to extend your deadline, man. You extend that deadline, then they're just going to start, <laughs> you know, oh, the new de deadline is 60 days out. Great. I'll start working on day 58. <laughs> right? Like, so, and you, if you get frustrated by that, then it's like, okay, how do you reframe it to realize, okay, that's not the strategy that is going to actually work for them. How do we deploy a strategy that's designed for their brain? How do we say, yep, okay, I see what you're doing there, and I understand how your brain works, and so now this is what we're going to do, right? So same thing with how you know your son best and how you can say, gosh, I know he loves video games. Let's try it. And then you have to take the mindset of exploration and trial and error. Well, let's try it. Let's test it out. See if it works. Well, that game didn't work. So <laughs> no, just... Right, which is then it's also... Life is anyway. Yeah. Life is just exploration. Yeah. Leadership shouldn't exactly. be any different. Okay, I, I yeah. didn't mean to cut and you off. Go ahead. Well, no, no, I was just going to say, I think it's also really important for leaders and people with ADHD or really anyone, when they find a strategy that works, write it down. 
keep track of it, post it on your wall so that when you're going back and you're like, what was that one thing I did that one time that worked real well that I can't think of right now because my working memory is not serving me right now. Oh, but I've got it on a sticky note up here and I can remember that this is what I need to do. And then I can actually try that strategy too. So, you know, even just again, that trial and error and exploration is really an important part of, of, managing and playing to the strengths of the ADHD brain. This is all so good, Gina. So good. Okay. So a couple things I want to add. So I um, worked with someone who has ADHD and I am not an ADHD expert, but um, she had a lot of strengths that were rare in addition to that. And so she, when I first started working with her, she said that she would often share an idea in a group setting at work. And she would often get these blank stares that she took as WTH or W whatever. Um, are you talking about? Like she took it as something was wrong with her because other people couldn't follow when she is one of the most creative humans ever, but she didn't recognize that about herself because everyone else was having a hard time following. But if, if someone, if more people were just aware that, okay, you're, and I think, I mean, we all have this general awareness that our brains operate differently than other people's, but that we don't need to march to the same drum and that our ideas are all going to be different. They're all going to be presented differently and just have this openness to that. Just like, oh, okay, I might not be following what you're saying, but it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It doesn't mean you're on on drugs. It doesn't mean anything about you. It's just like, Oh wait, our brains are operating differently. How can we work differently together? Yeah. Um, I had a client who she was let go from her company. And right before they did that, they were just like, I have never met anyone who thinks like you. And then, so clearly we need to get rid of you. <laughs> they, you know, and we want everyone to operate the same. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's just, Right, exactly. But I think to that point, when people are different, um, which I've had that on my performance review before too, I had that in the, you know, feedback from others and they're like, Gina just thinks differently than the rest of us. Right. And I was like, yeah, that seems like a I good do. thing. <laughs> Right. But in co- it's again, like you go back to the concept of it, the concept of it is great. Like, yay, differences. But the reality of what that looks like is totally different. And that's where it's like, you have to meet leaders where they are and you have to say, oh, this is what I mean when I say that. Because sometimes, you know, it's that whole, you're just so entrenched in it. You don't even realize it. Um, there's a, <clears throat> Oh gosh, I can't even think of it now, but this, you know, the, the fish can't, doesn't even know that they're swimming in the water, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's like the, the context for them is so different. So it's like, how do you help them realize that, you know, like this difference is not negative. And so I think there's a lot of little underpinnings of things that happen um, to people with ADHD. And unfortunately, um, I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head right now, but I mean, people with ADHD are more often on performance improvement plans. They are more often fired. Um, they're more often, you know, having trouble with jobs, um, quitting jobs and things like that because they don't feel like that they have the support. So as a class of people, um, as something, you know, as a group of people that they, they have, some issues with that. And then you think about, you know, people who do know and do have a diagnosis, they don't always want to disclose because they actually end up getting, um, having more issues when they disclose, uh, the backhanded comments, you know, different things that people will say to them. So they don't disclose because of the stigma that surrounds it and things like that. Um, and, you know, again, going back to the mindset, the beliefs that people have about whether or not ADHD is real or whatever the case may be. But it's just, it's really in an unfortunate place because I think companies and employers could gain so much if they really just understood more about that. And I, I would actually dare to say that if people are on a performance improvement plan. It's usually a missed accommodation. It's a missed adaptation that they need. And it's, you know, a missed, um, expectation. And so I think that's something where, you know, that's what I can even help companies with too, is we're looking at performance management issues 
okay, let's, let's peel back the layers a little bit and actually find out what's going on. Um, because I think there's, there's a lot more to that story once you start digging in and, you know, you think about the costs that are associated with firing and rehiring. And now we're in this, you know, such low unemployment, finding talent is difficult. And so for companies, you know, they're in a real pinch with some of the talent that if they have to fire someone, Um, you know, it could be really detrimental for lots of different reasons. So let's just dig into that performance issue and find out how we can help both the leader and um, the employee get to a place where they feel like they can both utilize their strengths and get done what the company needs to have done, which at the end of the day is what we need. That makes me think, Gina, when you're talking about the performance plan. So Kristen Sherry, who um, is the one who created the UMAP tool I use, she was on, I think I had her in episode two. She was talking about how when she was in the corporate space, the expectation was that she'd be collaborative because that's just, you know, like collaborative open environments, right? She doesn't enjoy collaboration. She, and this is an ADHD related, but she, she, her strengths are, she likes to think things through on her own. So she's like, she's silently effective, right? She doesn't need to have much of discussion. And so, and I don't know that she ever had poor, poor performance reviews because of it, but she was just thinking to herself, oh, I, this is um, a flaw in me that I don't, I'm not more collaborative. And it was just kind of generally thought, oh, people were just generally judging like, oh, you know. And so I think that it's just important to just be open to that for everyone and recognize, okay, lack of um, collaboration in someone or lack of whatever does not mean it's a flaw. It's just a, a mismatch between the person and expectations and the role. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there are so many things like that. You know, when you talk about like some people are like, I hate brainstorming. Don't put me in a room for, you know, brainstorming or ideation. And then you have other people who are like, put me in an ideation session, right? Like, and you, you want people with ADHD to be in your ideation sessions because they're going to come up with a lot of ideas, but they also, then we also have the processors that are going to go home and they're going to process and they're going to think about it and they're going to contemplate. And then they're going to come back and they're going to say, now I have a lot of great ideas, <laughs> you know? And so then it's like, or even, you know, for an ADHD or to be like, I can't necessarily be put on the spot, but, you know, let me go back to my desk and just start drawing. And I need to, you know, I need the actual tactical feeling of the, the things on my hand and all that kind of stuff. And then, but yeah, I mean, we all process that information differently. And when it's, we expect people to conform and comply, then, you know, expectations are not met and then people are disappointed. And then, you know, and people don't generally want, want to conform and comply. You know, we all truly want to be understood and we want to be our own person, but we feel like we, we should comply. Like we want to conform and comply in that we want to be accepted, but not because we truly want to be just like everyone else. What's the point of that? Yeah. And people, yeah. And people with an ADHD brain, they're going to be defiant. They're going to be the ones that ask why they're going to be like, Hey, um, I know you want me to do this process, but, um, it sucks. (laughs) (laughs) You know, they might just come out and say it. And if you have, you know, kind of a, security issues with that and you can't handle that as a leader. Um, you know, that can be difficult, but I also want to say like, shout out to our leaders. You know, I, I have been a leader in my career. Um, it's a difficult job because you're not only trying to manage the, the business side of things and the stakeholder, but then you've got your direct reports and there's just so much to manage. Um, and I just think that the, leaders carry a lot of weight. Um, and so that's where it's like, that's where I really want to drive home the point that what I am trying to do, the impact I'm trying to have is to help the leaders build the skills so that they can actually carry that weight more efficiently or, you know, distribute the weight somehow, but so that it doesn't feel like it's just one more thing. You know, I don't want accommodations to feel like it's just one more thing I have to manage. I don't want to have to worry about this ADHD crap because it's just one more thing I have to do. One more thing I have to think about. One more thing, one more thing. And I don't want this to be something where I'm piling on leaders because I'm not. I highly respect them. 
you know, some of my best friends are amazing leaders. Um, you know, I have just seen it in my experience. I've experienced it as a person with ADHD. I have, um, you know, listened to clients tell their stories and some of the things with leaders. And it's just, hey, leaders, how can we help you so that you can actually um, navigate this human potential in ways that benefit you, that benefit the company, that benefit the team. So not something again, where I'm piling on, but rather, you know, Hey leaders, I'm here to help you because I'm very passionate about leadership as well. Um, I think leadership is, um, especially the last couple of years, you know, it's definitely something that, um, I've really, you know, gotten deeper into, And so, um, yeah, I just, I want to make the point that it's just not one more thing to pile on, but rather let us help you. Yeah. So that you have what you need to move so that you have the skills to move forward. Right. If I said, I want to be an elephant trainer, um, just being an elephant trainer isn't enough, right? Like, or just wanting to be it. I need to actually gain the skills to do it as well so that I can do that. You know, my dream of elephant training, that's not really a dream, but it's fine. Anyway. <laughs> wish it was a dream of yours because I just, I don't know. There's something about that that makes me happy, Gina. Well, maybe I need to talk to uh, Steve. About <laughs> Perhaps there's some elephants Going on, on the safari. The safaris <laughs> and talking to the safari dude. And you want a safari and train some elephants. <laughs> okay. So I could talk to you about this forever and I probably will at some point on our next coffee date. <laughs> I know. We're close down the coffee shop, shop like yeah. we do. <laughs> We're going out to the patio because they just close their doors. It's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, Gina. Yeah. 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 What would you tell your younger self, knowing what you know now? Mm. Oh my gosh. Sherry, that is such a long answer. <laughs> okay, if there's one thing. <laughs> no, I, mean, I I just it's interesting because I kind of have gone back and forth about like, do I wish I didn't have an ADHD mm. brain? I have a one of my besties is beautifully neurotypical, and I just look at her and I'm just like, life is so easy for you. And I feel like sometimes, you know, for me, it's a struggle. Now, is that a fair comparison? I don't know that it is, but you know, that's how I feel. And so sometimes I think, gosh, for the struggle, would I trade my brain to be a neurotypical? Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people with ADHD that they, they hate it. It's brought so much discomfort and, um, you know, sucked the joy out of their life and they, it's been a lot of struggle. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, it is who I am and I, I, can appreciate and respect my brain now. And the fact that I am very creative and I am very spontaneous on different things. And there are a lot of things that I just think are lovely that make my world colorful and fun. And so I wouldn't trade that. And so I think what I would tell my younger self, um, I think what I would first start out with is by saying grades don't matter. Grades are not an indicator of whether or not you're smart or not, or going to be successful or not being on the Dean's list or, you know, being whatever, honor roll, whatever, valid Victorian, whatever, that does not actually, those are all arbitrary measurements that don't actually have anything to do with success in life. And so I would say that, and then I would have also told myself to just follow my heart as far as what my interests were. Um, as a people pleaser, I've always just done what everybody else thought I should do. Like you should go to this college. Okay. You should do this major. Okay. I actually didn't make those decisions for myself. I did it based on the recommendations Mm -hmm. from others. Um, and I never really took the time to know myself because I was just doing what everybody else wanted me to do. Um, and so I think I would tell my younger self to just really, and especially now knowing that an ADHD brain is an interest brain, you know, so follow your interest. And when you're interested, you can be highly successful, which is why I feel like, you know, this is my purpose. Um, and why I am here on this 
on this planet is to help other people understand how to show up as the, their best selves and be the best that they can be. And again, putting some strategy behind that passion that I have. Um, and I just think that that can be so impactful for the human experience and who we are day to day. Um, and I just really want that. And I actually want it for if I can impact the workplace Um, and I can make an impact for those who have ADHD, then the two sons who I suspect have ADHD can enter their workforce in a much different way. Um, and so, you know, I feel like I'm doing it for them as well. Um, and there's just a lot of work to do in the neurodiverse ADHD space. And I just, um, you know, really want to have the impact to make things better for leaders and for employees and for, you know, um, those who are going, navigating this world now. So yeah. So there you go. Thank you so much, Gina. Okay. Where can people find you? Um, well, they can reach out. Um, my website is magnifyinnovationgroup.com. Or if they have an inquiry or they want to reach out and talk, um, they can send an email to info at magnifyinnovationgroup.com or to Gina at magnifyinnovationgroup.com. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn under Gina Hibbard Brown on LinkedIn, um, but they can find me that way too. And I would love to connect, have coffee, um, talk about you know what we can do from a corporate standpoint, or I work with individuals one-on-one. Um, I work with corporations. We can do, you know, coaching programs with not only leaders and individuals, but also um, beyond that actual neurodiversity um, as well. And actually, I've got an amazing team that I work with. Um, I have a neuropsychologist, an occupational therapist, um, an innovation expert. So there are a lot of amazing people that I am just... Uh, honored to be able to work with and and share this passion with so it's pretty exciting I love it I I love it yeah so um people probably shouldn't go to coffee with both of us because we would probably actually be there for several hours but if you go with just Gina I said can they get a word in edgewise I don't even <laughs> know. I don't know maybe here yeah. there thank you so much oh my gosh I I just always have so much fun with you. And I just, I'm so glad we met. I'm so glad we met. And I I need to put out there. So Lisa, Uh even who, um, she's going to be on my podcast eventually. She's the one who connected us. And she said, Sherry, um, you need a Regina. You're going to be BFFs. And I feel like we kind of established that BFF relationship just via text initially. So yeah, now it's, you know, knowing you in person is even that much better. Thinking that, yeah, I was like, Lisa, thank you, thank you for connecting us. I think that actually the first time we met in person and had lunch, do you remember? We went to lunch. We were there for almost three hours. Like they had already. Seen- oh, I was thinking it was more than three. Three? Maybe That's not bad. bad. I don't know, but I just remember we were there. It was busy, and then it wasn't busy, and then they were cleaning up and preparing for the. And then I think the, the dinner yeah. crowd came in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, oh. Something has transitioned here. Should we eat again? again? I don't know. It's like, well, I'm kind of hungry again. I mean, we did eat like three, four hours ago. But yeah, I mean, it's just, and that's, I think that is one of my, I think superpowers is authentically connecting with other people. And I just, I love it. And I love hearing other people's stories and learning more about them and all that kind of stuff too. So Sherry, it has been a delight, not only knowing you, but sharing coffee, shutting down places is what we do. Cause yeah, last time we had coffee, it's like, Oh, they're, they're closed now. So did you to go. I noticed you turned the lights off. Gina, you're awesome. Thank you for being. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you for being you. Thank you for being the authentic version of yourself. Thank you. Neurodivergent and a blast. I love it. Thank you for having me, Sherry. I appreciate you very, very much. (laughs) Thanks everyone for joining us today. And um, yeah, reach out to Gina. I'll have everything in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening to the Dash Mindset Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcast player, tell your friends, and leave us a review. Follow me on my social media platforms highlighted in the show notes and get in touch with me at thedashmindset.com. Share the topics you'd like me to explore in future episodes. 
Thanks again for listening to the Dash Mindset Podcast. We'll see you next time. Design and differentiate your Dash, your way, and make today amazing.